punk record labels and the record stores, you know, and all these people, they're doing it themselves. I think the Warped Tour just kind, kind of promotes the DIY idealism that punk rock's all about. No dressing rooms, no hierarchy. Maybe some bands are in vans or buses. You never know when you're gonna play. At 11 o'clock, I'm telling the venue, we're going doors because kids know the schedule is posted. They got to get in because we may have the first band at 11.30. <laughs> Some people might accuse me of taking the edge off of punk rock, but I believe punk rock should be able to listen to by everyone. And it's all varying degrees of punk rock. And it's great that I can put the casualties and Good Charlotte in the same setting. But this is one of the best tours for the casualties because we get in front of so many new kids, you know? So many kids that like are uh, new to this kind of punk rock. You get the real hardcore like casualty fans, you know, up in the front, and then you see I see kids in the back just really interested, and then I'll see that kid later when we're just hanging out at our tent, and he'll like get a T-shirt, he'll get a CD and stuff, and so that's it's cool, like you know, exposing those kids to some of this kind of like yeah, you have your other stuff that most of the kids here like, but like come check this out, you know. <laughs> It's just kind of kept growing. We have corporate affiliation, but we operate very independently in how we do this thing because they don't want to pretend that they know how to produce this tour. just see it as another commercial venture designed to make money for everybody involved and take it all off the people who go to the gig. I don't think that's very nice at all. Oh, I'm going to sing about big business and, you know, fuck this, fuck that, yet I'm going to make all this money for this big company, you know what I mean? It's, it's completely ironic. It's the business taking over, you know, they're sponsored by all kinds of companies. It's just business and it's all, like, just conning the kids to buy millions and millions of pounds worth of merchandise and that's all it is. The, the problem is, is that, okay, if you decide like, okay, I'm not going to have anything to do with corporations because I'm so much of a crusty gutter punk and I'm the most punk guy in the world, okay, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with corporations. Well, you're going to pretty much have to sit in your house and never go outside because unfortunately, if you live in America and most parts of the world, corporations make the clothes that you're wearing right now makes the, the antiperspirant everyone's wearing, the perfume that you're wearing, the, the food that you eat. Vans is a big corporation, although they're more geared towards what we do and they're supporting the scene. That was cool. The first year we had a rough time in 96, well, Vans, hmm, they were all cautious. But then they started getting to know us and see that we were really the same culture. We were supporting the same things. When Target came in, it really it really upset us, and we almost thought about not doing it. But then, you know, hey, I, I shop at Target all the time. Thanks to them, that, that music is still out there, you know, that took care of us. They pay for our buses. They make sure that we, we stay alive. You throw out the argument of, like, well, what's so offensive about it? And people really can't really say exactly why it's offensive because it, it's not, you know, people have to realize that they're not representing an entire community all the time. People do things because they're individual and that's what how they want to have their band. It's, I think it's totally okay to go in and take their money as much as possible. I think that's more punk than anything else. It's easier for us to sort of use the, 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 the tools and the channels that the capitalist industry are offering us for free than to try to do it ourselves and reach not as many people as those greedy bastards are opening the ways for us to reach. Some people say they're fighting for our freedom, they're fighting for our safety. Some people say they're fighting for oil companies and for Halliburton and for multinational corporations. I don't want to tell you what to believe. All I want to ask of you is try to look through the haze and try to look through the fucking bullshit.
There seems to be an invisible line for everybody that's ever touched upon punk rock. And that invisible line almost goes from the pistols breaking up at Winterland to mumble, 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 maybe something happened and maybe it didn't, and then hi, Nirvana. That's like 15 years in the middle of that. So what do you think punk rock did? Go away and have a rest for 15 years? No, punk rock carried on. The punk rock world was healthy and wonderful, but it all went underground. So as we hear, we use punk revivals. It's never been a punk revival because punk's never been away. And you've stopped by it all these years and it's been hard. It's been really hard. Again, if you go like 20 years with no backing or no support or nothing back in the UK, and the only thing that kept us going is the people within gigs and all the punks they used to come and visit us because they knew that we believe, really believed in the music as much as them. still write about things that, that matter to me and, and things that I find important and I hope that if I find them important and they, they matter to me then other people will find them important and they'll matter to them and therefore they're worth doing. If you'd have said to me that I'd still be in a band 26 years on, I would have laughed in your face. If you'd said to me at the time that punk rock has any sort of future in terms of 26 years, I equally would have laughed in your face. Most of Distortion is still a punk band. You know, we've held on to most of the ideals that we had when we started the band. The rebellion and the energy and the angst, the dissatisfaction for the status quo. Who ever thought that you'd, you know, make a record that would last? You're like, we, we never just, thought we'd be alive in 20 years. Yeah, that's exactly much, much less sit there talking about it. I never thought I would play punk rock music for more than the night that we got up and played. We're all addicted to it. That's my downfall. You know, and sometimes I wonder we should sort of start this at Betty Ford clinic for punk rockers. We play all over the world, and I mean, punk is still a big thing. It's probably bigger now than it's ever been. It's, it's getting younger. It's there's frightening. A, there's a new wave of people who, who come to see us now. We don't just get the people that were around when we first started. We get, like, you know, those 12-year-old kids there last night with singing 999 songs, you know? Just watching these bands keep the show as good as a hundred years ago, up to that same level of energy and excitement, is and watching the crowd, it was just like, yeah, now this is this is longevity of purpose. The thing about the punk lifestyle is that it is the real alternative lifestyle, you know, we're not part of the true society and um, we don't want to be cheated by society. You know, I was born at the end of the Second World War and there's a big thing about, oh, all these pensioners, well, you know, like, they won't get their pensions when they're 65 or whatever age, you know. Who cares about that? The government will cheat you if they can, you know, so why bother? You've got to do your own thing. UK subs, hello, we're the UK subs. Boom, 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 top of the pops, front page headlines, everything. Bluer, greener, Elvin Gibbs, Nicky Garrett, pulling shapes, green vinyl singles, red vinyl albums, this, then, the other. Then suddenly they've vanished. No, they haven't vanished. They've only vanished if you live in normality. If you are a fully paid up resident of planet normal, A, don't need to know about you and what you're doing. B, more importantly, the UK subs never vanished. They're still there. God bless old Charlie. He, he's doing, you know, every album for the letter for the bloody alphabet. Night, 
there's been this traffic of people through that band. If they ever have a reunion, they'll need to hire fucking Dodger Stadium to put all the boys in. Charlie Harper, uh, Brian Barnes, Alan, Alan Campbell, Campbell, Jason Lawsman. Ed was my dinner. <clears throat> Nick Garrett. <laughs> Alvin Gibbs, Hi. Steve Roberts, Pete Davis. I was just thinking about all the different periods of the UK subs because there's like the period before I joined and then there's the period after me when it was Jim Moncur and Captain Scarlet. You had the people who went to Wisconsin and then I come back with Alan and Brian. Paul Slack. Paul Slack. Steve Slack. Steve Slack. My brother was in the subs, you know, the very first couple of months or whatever. He didn't want to do it. I stepped in. Flea. Tez. Who the hell else First time we ever came to the States, I mean, we, we loved it straight away. Our first show was in a place called Hurrah's. It was packed out. And we come on stage and all the girls started screaming. And we thought, shit, we're going to be the Beatles or something like this. It was suddenly, oh, you're number 20-something in the charts. You've got to do Top of the Pops. UK subs and Stranglehold. One, two, three, four, five, six. When we were selling a lot of records and um, we were going on tour, we thought we could do no wrong. Everything we put out would sell a lot. The record company wanted the more commercial stuff and we wanted to put out the good stuff like Warhead and Countdown. We had it our way because we had complete artistic control, but we dived down and we kind of disappeared from the media. But. It's done us good, really, because, you know, we've been on the road ever since. 20 years, we're still on the road. If we would have gone up there and been like the media darlings and then the media want to kick us out a year later and get someone else in, and now we're on the road forever. That's a small run, isn't it? Oh, no. Last Fred Erickson. Wow, yes. Jason Willer. Ison. Rap, Phoebe. Oh, definitely John, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Somebody Armstrong as well, fucking... It's a straight Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first, the whole band. <laughs> There's a point when you get past the certain threshold of popularity and name recognition, then it gives you a certain longevity. And each plateau you go up, after that gives you more longevity. When you get to the level of the Clash and the Pistols, there, you've got historic lo long longevity there. For us, we, we didn't quite reach that plateau. We were two rungs down from that. Nevertheless, it was enough to make us internationally well-known, and here we are almost 30 years later, and we can still play almost anywhere in the world, and there is still an audience. Poor sod. First of all, 